Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Allison Bainbridge, and I want to um, extend a warm welcome to all of our viewers, loyal Book Passage customers, um, mystery fans, and anyone else who's out there. Um, how lucky are we to be able to share in a conversation with two of the most popular mystery writers discussing their latest books? Reese Bone's going to talk about the Venice sketchbook and Car Black is going to tell us about three hours in Paris. And if anyone has any questions, we'll try to get to some questions at the uh, toward the end of the hour. So please feel free to post it on the YouTube chat. So the recent car, car really need no introduction. Indulge me as I give you a brief background on both these extraordinary authors. Uh, book, passage custom, book Passage customers are so fortunate um, to have Reese and Kara as two of our many local writers, because this means that they always visit our store when they have a new book to discuss. Um, in addition, Reese has participated in many of our popular mystery writing conferences, and um, Kara is currently a co-chair. Now, of course, those conferences have been on hold, and uh, we won't be having it this year, but we really hope to renew our mystery writing conferences next summer. So if you're interested, please um, make sure you keep up with um, book passage posts and we will let you know as soon as it becomes available. Um, Reese is an author known for pairing mystery and humor. She is a New York bestselling author, New York Times bestselling author of more than 40 novels, the winner of many literary and mystery writing awards, including the Agatha Award for Best Historic Novel. Her books have been translated into many languages, and she has fans around the world, including 17,000 Facebook followers. She's a transplanted Brit. And she divides her time between California and Arizona, where she is currently going to be speaking to us from. When she's not writing, she loves to travel, sing, hike, paint, play the Celtic harp. I love that little trivia and spoil her grandchildren. Kara is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of 19 books in the private investigator Amy LeDuc series, which is set in Paris. Kara has also received many awards, including multiple nominations for the Anthony and McCavity Awards, a Washington Post Book World Book of the Year citation, and then I'm not going to say this correctly because I only had up to high school French, but Medaille, Medaille de la Ville de Paris, the Paris City Medal, which is awarded in recognition of contribution to international culture with more than 400,000 books in print, the Amy LeDuc series has been translated into many languages as well. So a quick little anecdote, if you happen to be lucky enough to be in the store when book passage owner Elaine Petricelli is there, she loves suggesting books. And I don't know how she does it, but she's read everything. Um, she'll tell you a story about an author or, or she'll talk about, uh, she'll give you a little anecdote. The other day I was in the store with her and I overheard her talking about Cara and her books to a customer and she was saying, that Cara's research is so impeccable that if she writes that a street in Paris is a one-way street going a certain way, you can be sure, be sure that she has made sure to get that direction correct. That's how exact she is. So without further ado, please enjoy and take it away, Reese and Cara. Now Kara's gone, she's run away. Oh. <laughs> there she is. Oops. Where oh. am I? Voila. <laughs> so, sorry. We're good to go now, we can hear you. Good to go, you both are on. Can you see me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Bonsoir. I mean, bon après midi, everyone. Sorry, I can't see you. Um, thank you all for joining us. And I'm so thrilled to talk with Reese and hear about her new book, The Venice Sketchbook. Um, so both of our books will hopefully take you to Venice this afternoon and Paris. Of course, mine is 1940s Paris. And you're kind of going back and forth, I think, time-wise, right, Reese? Yeah, yeah. Mine yeah. is part of it. It starts in 1928. And then we move to 1938, 39, and then the war years. And then we're in 2001. So we're spanning really two, two women's lifetimes. 
Great, great. So, you know, I think about, you know, the time now where we are and it's all about travel and escape. And um, I have to say the first and only time I was in Venice was just before the pandemic in 2019. And I couldn't believe <clears throat> that it was just like all the pictures I've seen. <clears throat> and I wonder how you felt <coughs> writing, excuse me, <coughs> writing about a city that is just, you know, everyone has a Venice. <coughs> the well, time it, yeah, Venice has been part of my life pretty much for most of my life. So it's a city that I feel very comfortable in. Um, when I was a child, my aunt, I had, I had a prim and proper aunt who was very like Aunt Hortensia in the book. You know, she would say, you know, we, no lady goes out unescorted after dinner. She would say things like that. But every, every Easter she spent in Venice. And when I was a teenager, I found myself wondering, I wonder if she meets somebody in Venice. Why else would you go every single year to Venice? And I thought, well, what if she's got this secret life? And so the, the germ of this book was actually planted way back then. And, um, and then my parents started renting a little villa just outside Venice in the town of Treviso. And every day we'd drive in and they'd park at the parking garage and they'd give some money to my brother and me. And they'd say, see you at five o'clock. Can you imagine doing that with your kids these days? No, I don't think you would. Um, so um, we would wander around. We knew where to find the best gelato. We knew, knew we could find all sorts of food. Um, you okay, Cara? I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, and we would go over to the Lido and swim. And the, you know, so I became very familiar with the city and I hadn't been back until I took my oldest daughter when she graduated from high school. And so I'm walking around and then suddenly I go, oh, wait, if you go through that little tunnel there and She'd say, you can't go through someone's backyard. And I'd say, well, you watch. And we'd go through and I'd say, I bet you'd come out and you see, see you do. And, and it was funny, it was all there still. And the fact is I've been many, many times to Venice, but it never fails to take my breath away. Each time I, I just stand there and I go, you know, it's just those, those buildings. They're, they're so improbable because if you look now, of course the water levels reason, and a lot of them have got a bottom floor. The door is half hidden, the steps are half hidden underwater. And they are all sitting on wooden pilings in mud. Why is the whole thing not sunk years ago? It doesn't make any sense at all that it's there. It's just one of those miracle cities. Um, and when you just, sometimes you get the mist and the, the, the buildings are floating. And I mean, it's, it's the sort of place you have to write about because it's, Obviously the story is about women's lives, but it's really a story about Venice. You know, it's a complete homage to Venice. Homage <coughs> character. I have to say that I read a short story by Henry James, <clears throat> the Aspirin Papers about Venice years ago. And I was convinced that when I went to Venice, I would find this villa that supposedly Byron's mistress had been in and this whole story and it was, and then once I got on that, whatever you call it, on the Grand Canal, the boat, the ferry boat, you just go back. Vaporetto, yeah. I just thought, I'm just going to sit on the Vaporetto and go up and down the canal, Grand Canal, all day, yeah. because yeah. It, it was amazing, you know. Yeah. And um, I have to say I did that. But <clears throat> can you talk about what what it is that we we what keeps drawing us back? I mean, other people, I know what draws you back to Venice, but... Yeah. You know, what, and, and where you get the best gelato. I think we all want to know that. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well, um, the, you know, Venice is divided into different neighborhoods. And if you go across the Grand Canal from where St. Mark's is, you're in a neighborhood called Dosodoro, which is, um, it's where the, the academia is. And that used to be where a real Academy of Art was, where there were students. They've moved that now across the other side of the Zattery. Um, and there's also the, the university there. So it's much more laid back than the St. Mark's side. You know, there's lots of little cafes and things like that. And if you go right across the Dosodoro, you come to a, a wider canal um, uh, called, uh, and then the island across the Judica. Um, and uh, that's where the cruise ships come these days, which is a huge, scary thing because <clears throat> you're standing there and this enormous cruise ship goes past you. And I'm sure it's not doing any good to anything. But on the other side there, uh, there's a wide pavement called the Zattere, 
And on there, there is um, a gelato shop which does the best stracciatelli in the world. So, um, according to me. But, Do you remember um, the name? <laughs> um, no, I, I can take you to it. Um, but uh, okay. I never really, you know, I just, we just stopped there on our way back every night and just, okay, we had to have, yeah. But there's a couple of other good ones too. But, you know, the thing with Venice these days, it's been so overwhelmed by tourism. And when you have one day, what last, when I was there, which was two years ago now, when I was doing the final research on this book, we had six cruise ships in. Now, can you imagine those tiny little alleyways flooded? They all come and they all walk from Rialto to St. Mark's and they all go around St. Mark's, you know, and that's, um, and then luckily at four o'clock, they all go back to the cruise ship for their dinner. So luckily, if you want to eat normally, you can usually do that because they've all gone back to dinner on, on the ship, but it really, it spoils Venice. One of the things that's fantastic about Venice, well, two things, all the religious festivals still happen today um, Venetian life is still pretty much as it was. You, you watch a basket being lowered from an upstairs window and then you realize it's being lowered into this little boat and someone drops a loaf of bread and a newspaper in it and then it's hauled up again. And you know, that, that's done every morning. And, and, and the shops there, if you don't go where it's all the um, made in Asia masks and mm -hmm. everything, they, have, they still have shops that, for example, there's one shop that just sells pens. And there's one shop that just sells marbled paper. Mm. Say to yourself, who could pay the rent on a shop? Because how, how often <laughs> would someone say, yeah, I think I need marbled paper today. It doesn't happen very often, I'm sure. But the fact is that they're there and the shop near us where we were staying last time had pu wooden puppets. I mean, not the sort that you're selling to tourists, but the old fashioned wooden puppets. Um, so, you know, I, I just find browsing shops is a great thing to do in Venice. The other thing I find, cause I take loads of photos when I'm somewhere is door knockers. They have mm -hmm. most incredible um, door knockers in the shapes of gods and, and lions and everything. So I walk around taking pictures of door knockers everywhere. Cause I love those too. Oh yeah, I love those. So we went into this bookstore that had a gondola in it. <clears throat> I can't remember the name. I'm sure a it's lot of people know it. It's called the Aqua Alta. Aqua Alta, yeah. And afterwards there was a flood and we saw pictures. It was yeah. it was so sad to see the, the water in that. But um, in that store, uh, it, it became famous because um, it doesn't flood normally. And if it is gonna flood, they put all the books quickly into the gondola. However, that last time, the flood water was higher than it's ever been and it did actually ruin a lot of books so you know that was very sad there's oh, also no. a bookstore i love which is on the it's on the um uh the street of the um of the assassins and it really is called the street of the assassins and if you've read my book there's a nice little dialogue about that when um leo says to to juliet do you know what this she says well it must be called um she translates the street of the assassins and she says, assassins have their own street. And he says, of course, how else would you need, how else would you uh, know where to find one when you needed one? And he, she says, well, do the police not worry about that? He says, well, the police need assassins too. And that's just so Venetian, you know, that they talk as if the past and the present just blur into, into one, which I really like. Yeah. <clears throat> what, what is, you know, so the title, I think we were talking a while back when you were coming up with this title. Mm -hmm. And and I remember, I mean, now I, I mean, I really like it. It's beautiful, it's wonderful, it's simple, it says a lot. But you I mean, you're thinking about things as well. And I mean, where did that come from? Do you, do you come up with that yourself? Do you get some pullback from the publisher? <clears throat> How does that work? No, uh, uh, it was probably, it was my working title from day one because the whole thing, the whole um, enigma of the story, the puzzle of the story hangs on the fact that when Juliet is an old woman and she's lying dying and she insists that her great niece Caroline takes this little cardboard box and Caroline thinks there might be some lovely jewels or something in it, but instead there's just, there are three keys and a sketchbook and all the pictures are of Venice. And that sketchbook becomes the clue that really opens up the story of Juliet's life. And um, I have to show you something. Um, my publisher always does something really cool on the covers. So this is the cover of the Venice sketchbook. But then if you take that off and you look like this, that's what you find. 
Oh, it's beautiful. So right on the cover, that's gorgeous. Right on the cover. And that is one of my sketches <clears throat> because um, when I go anywhere, I take my own sketchbook and I sketch everywhere. So when I knew that we wanted to call it the Venice sketchbook, I said, well, I want to show you some sketches I've done. And they said, oh, we have to use this on the cover. So that's really cool. I like that. Wow. I mean, I take photographs and sometimes they've used the photographs on, on my covers. But, I uh, yeah, I yeah. remember one with the bicycle that time. That was really good. I like that. Thank you. Yeah, of course, the bicycle was stolen after that. So, but anyway, as it is, <clears throat> what, um, so you, I mean, you write a series, several series, you write standalones. Where do you see things going? And I think you have some kind of special news to tell us, right? Oh, well, thank you. Special news. <laughs> yeah. no, so I've been doing, the past few years, I've been doing one of my Royal Spinus series <laughs> and then one of the standalones. And frankly, you know, two books a year is working quite hard especially because all of my bigger books take place somewhere. So I have to go and research. I mean, I know it's really hard to spend a summer in Nice and then a summer in Venice, but you know, someone has to do it. But, someone, um, has to do it. Yes. someone has to do it. But um, uh, my daughter came to me last year and she said, I think um, that I could help you um, with the Molly Murphy series. She said, I'd like to, I'd like to write it with you. Can you, can you refresh everybody's mind yeah. about Molly? Yeah, Molly Murphy is, um, she's my heroine. It's New York, early 1900s. She's an Irish immigrant who fled from Ireland after she accidentally kills the man who's trying to rape her. She gets as far as Ellis Island and while she's there, a murder occurs and she's been using an assumed name and the name she's assumed shows up as the prime suspect. So that was the driving force behind Murphy's Law, which was the first book in that series. And I've by now done 17 books in that series. So Molly's been around for quite a while. And most of the stories are very much about the immigrant experience and um, uh, obviously New York in the early 1900s. Um, and it's so atmospheric. I love those books, really, especially. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, little, little, little. <laughs> I said, I, you know, I was slightly, I know Claire's a very good writer, but writing with someone is, uh, could be a little challenging. So I said, well, we, you know, we need to come up with a really good idea to um, convince my agent that we should be doing this. And she came up with a brilliant idea. Um, she said, well, we, it's been four years since we've had one of these books. We need to remind people, just as you did, we need to remind people who Molly is and her situation. So she, her, it was her idea, this book, and it's that Molly goes back to Ellis Island and as part of a clothing drive with her friends from Vassa to hand out clothing to the Italian immigrants who are coming in with literally very light clothing and it's freezing in the middle of winter. And while they were, while they're there, they see this, this woman whose hair, red hair looks very like Molly's and her little ward, Bridie gets lost. And when they find her, they say, what, what happened to you? Why did you run off? She said, but I thought I was following you. And Anyway, that night, Daniel comes home very late. Daniel, her husband, husband comes <clears> home <throat> and he says, um, there was a murder on Ellis Island and, and the person we've picked up looks just like you. So, you know, that's the driving force behind this book, which has made it really fun to write. And obviously Molly can see her own, her own past in this woman and is determined to prove her innocence against all odds, really. Um, and so working with Claire, it turned out to be an absolute joy. I mean, I thought I was going to have to guide her a lot more saying, well, you know, we need to see such and such happen in this and we need to get this, this needs to, but she didn't. She just said, she'd call me and she'd say, well, I, I went ahead with the party scene and I've done the two new scenes after that. And they were always perfect. And she had some new, new, fresh ideas. So if you look at it now, we were talking about this the other day, I can't tell which are my books and which are hers, which I think is a great compliment. So we're going to be doing those books together. And I hope after about two or three, I can just stay and let her take over and run with it, which would be a lot of fun. Yeah, well, Lee Child has done that. Uh, you know, everyone knows who Lee Child is, but we, Reese and I know him well from, yeah. from yeah. being in the mystery community. And Lee had just sort of felt like he'd sort of gone far enough with Jack Reacher yeah. and his brother, um, he, he, they were talking and his brother sort of came in like, like that. And, and they wrote, I believe the one together last year. 
Yes. Maybe it was this year. And they're going to continue on doing that. Um, yeah. you know, yeah. But I think he, his brother is taking over completely. After yeah, well, and Andrew's a really good writer in his own right, too. So I mean, it's, it's, you know, it, Lee could be quite um, com comforted in the fact that it, he would do a really good job. Right, and it's freshening it up too. You know, it's looking yeah. at it in another yeah. way. And, yeah. and I was like, yeah, that's, I totally get that. I think, you know, and I think people want to keep reading about Jack oh, Reacher. Probably, yeah. And, um, you know, in my case, I was getting literally every week, getting four or five letters saying, when is there going to be another Molly book? You know, and I kept writing and saying, I'm sorry, I just don't have time right now. So now I can say, ha ha, that is going to be one and it's going to be very good. And um, it's coming out early next year and it's called Wild Irish Rose. Ooh, nice title. Nice yeah. title. What year is it set? It's set in 1907, early 1907. So, you know, I, I was saying the other day, so we're up to 1907, there's lots of interesting things going to be happening in New York, including this is the first year they had the ball in Times Square. So we might use that later on. But then I said, well, if I get really fed up with Molly, we're getting very close to 1911, I'll just put her on the Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> but I know you've often talked about it got to a point where Molly had a child and it was very difficult because putting herself in danger, which I also feel is yeah. difficult in my stories with Amy LeDuc. She's, you know, yeah. got this child and why is she going to be putting herself in danger, even though part of her is hardwired that way, or it's the story. Um, so my next story takes place when her daughter's now finally three years old <clears throat> and the biological father gets a little more involved. Mm -hmm. So she does have some breathing space, which is, yeah. you know, but I, it's true, you have to think about the child if you're going to have a child in the story. Yeah, and the other thing with Molly, too, of course, she's, she's an Irish woman in New York in 1907. I mean, the, 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 the likelihood she won't have more children and fairly regularly is, is probably very small. So, you know, so far I had to deal with she had a miscarriage last year and then she was very depressed after it. But, you know, that's not going to happen forever. So she might have more children to look after. So do we bring in a really nice nanny who's just going to be there and take care of everything? We've got to think that out, you know. Yeah, right. That's a very important point. <laughs> um, what do you think it is about writing a story, you know, like especially historical fiction, like this, you know, the Venice sketchbook? It seems there are so many books, or I'm more attuned to them. I don't know, maybe my eye catches them more, you know, since I wrote this historical fiction yeah. thriller. Um, is it, are there more? Are people writing stories about that, um, you know? <clears throat> or is it, is it that they've always been there? I just have to say, before the pandemic, I was in Bristol, UK, for the crime conference. And I was on a panel with young British writers, female writers, and they had written these stories, which sadly I had never read. Of course, I got all their books when I was there, but they were writing about these things as well, about World War II, and they were in their 30s. So I never got a chance, but I was thinking, is it because they're, they grew up with grandmothers or great grandmothers? Are they, did they find something, you know, like in your story? Is it, is it just stories that, you know, they're, the grandparent is leaving, you know, is dying, um, that they want to tell those stories that enough, enough generations or time has passed? Well, I, I mean, for me, and I think this is true for a lot of people, World War II was the last clear time when we had a, a, a good sense of good versus evil. You know, every war, every conflict since then has been tinged with so many shades of gray. Are we doing the right thing? No, I don't think we're doing the right thing. You know, Vietnam, Kuwait, all of those things. But World War II, everybody, I think, had a good feel that this is evil. And if we don't stop it, evil will swallow the world. And so everybody had this sense of purpose that they had to do their bit. They had to do the right thing. Um, and I think also the whole time you're living with a sense of danger and heightened emotion right. to make for really good stories. I mean, if at times, as you know, from your World War II book, where someone would take the ultimate risk, um, people took, ordinary people took risks all the time. You think about all those young British women who were parachuted into France, like your heroine, and who cycled around with a radio in the, in the basket of their you know, knowing that their chances of survival were very, very small, and yet they did it. More people came to take their place. So you had people who were living lives that they weren't meant to live, 
and stories that were beyond comprehension brave. Why would anyone do this? Why would, you know, if I spoke good French, would I go and volunteer to be dropped into France and to walk past the Germans with the radio in the basket of my bike? I don't think I would, and yet they did. So, you know, I think it's, you're, li you're looking at a time of great braveries, but you're also looking at a time of small sacrifices and the, the mothers who put their children on the train to evacuate them. You put your right. five-year-old five son on a train with a label around his neck and you didn't know if you'd ever see him again. You know, all those little things like that. Um, I was born in the middle of it. So I've obviously have a special, I don't remember anything except deep in my subconscious are the fears. If there's a siren, my heart starts racing. And if, uh, if um, I see searchlights across the sky, I immediately do that because obviously those were things. And apparently when I was one year old, I knew the difference in sound between our planes and enemy planes. And if, wow. I, heard, if I heard enemy planes approaching, I had to get my little stool and take it behind the big oak door so that if the windows of the house blew in, I wouldn't get any glass on me. So, you know, that's survival at a really early age. So everybody was living with that heightened sense of danger, emotion, survival. So I think the number of stories you can tell are infinite. If you look recently what's come out. Last year, Kate Quinn did one called The Huntress about right. female flyers in Russia. I mean, there's so, and I think the other thing that I was talking about the other day in one of these, you know, I've done like a podcast or an interview a day recently, um, was that, the, all the war stories after the war were the heroism of men. And only recently has it come out and been acknowledged that women were pretty darn heroic too. And they Thank you. That, <clears throat> that is an excellent point. People say, how could you write about a female assassin? <clears throat> Excuse me. It's, there was a whole Russian a troop of Russian women who were, were assassins, snipers. Yeah, yeah. You know, and... I mean, why wouldn't you use women who had, you know, if they were trained and had the skill or like, yeah. you know, Kate's book, the, you know, the flyers. And I had grown up reading so many of my father's, you know, spy stories. And let's face it, everything we read, it's always, always men. Yeah. yeah. I was like, women can do that. They don't just only relay messages or, you know, help people hide or help the, you know, the downed RAF pilots get here or there. They can actually be much more proactive. So I wrote the book I wanted to read too. I think yeah. that was, probably, you know, because women, <clears throat> women should have a, another uh, role. I thought, <laughs> but so do you think that that's a lot of these stories are coming out now because our documents have been declassified, maybe, or and that younger women are looking at that generation. Or I was just so struck by this um, these people in my panel and um, you know how they. You know, maybe they looked at it that way as well. You know, it was more of a, you know, there were the, you know, the bad guys, you know, the Nazis, you could. I think behind it, that. <clears throat> I think a lot of this started to come out when, as you say, when things were declassified, when for the first time we knew about Bletchley Park and we knew that there were young women there who could say nothing of what they were doing. Everybody thought, oh, she's doing office work. Isn't that nice? And in fact, she was helping with decoding that saved a whole convoy of ships. Um, and these, they, you know, they were, it, it was normally the men who were given the best jobs there and the women were given the rotten jobs that nobody else wanted. And um, they worked on night shifts and they worked in freezing cold huts or very hot, hot huts in the summer. And they had, they were billeted in nasty crummy houses. So they enjoyed horrible conditions. And then they were not allowed to talk about it afterwards, after the war. So their parents or their spouses or their loved ones had no idea that they'd done something heroic. And it wasn't till the mid nineties that people started talking about it. And then I think after that, people started to say, oh, well, we should write some of these stories before they're forgotten. I think that was the driving force. <coughs> One driving force, it was the fact that anybody who did anything in World War II was about to die. And exactly. so if you didn't have these stories written down now, they were gone forever. And so suddenly there's this big inter interest in preserving everybody's story, however small, you know, whether I was a wife living in a town that was bombed. I'm writing, I've just finished a story, my next year's book, which is very different. It's about um, um, a Cockney woman in London whose house is bombed and she's buried in the rubble. And it's only just very lucky that they actually can dig her out. But then 
she's evacuated to the country and the place they evacuate her to is right next to one of the huge bomber bases. So these giant aircraft take off all night flying to Germany and half of them don't come back. So, you know, this is, this is, this is the war at home and what the reality of what it was like for people. So there are so many stories still left to be done. I, you know, I don't know when people are going to, when readers are going to say, okay, we've had enough of World War II, let's move on. Well, when I went doing research, I went, when I was in London, I went to Churchill's War Rooms, mm -hmm. which is underground, um, you know, like downtown London. And I was like, it was unchanged. You know, they had the typewriters with the felt on them because Churchill didn't want to hear tuck, 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 tuck of typewriters. Yeah. There were the maps on the walls, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with, with the colors of stick pins. And it was, you know, the green kind of enamel or Mel Melmac um, telephones. The little tiny room where Churchill would go and talk to, talk to um, Roosevelt. And then I, when I walked down there, I realized how small everything was yeah. and how tiny and claustrophobic. And they all had these gas masks because they thought there would be gassing. And I thought that's really important to do, to do on the ground research, to go there, to, yeah. to walk the ground as they say. <clears throat> and then I went to the Imperial War Museum, I believe, and they had this sort of um, thing where you go in and it's like you're in the blitz where there's yeah, the bombing, yeah, right? Absolutely. Yes, I've done that too, yeah. And you, My you, friend you, got so scared she ran out. It's really you're in a tiny shelter and everything starts to shake yeah. around you and the noise becomes overwhelmingly loud and the bombs fall around you. Yeah, that's, that's how it was. And you know, it's interesting, my husband, John, who was um, quite a lot older than me, he was um, like 11, 12 during the war and um, uh, he, he just took it very much for granted. He was, he was riding, he was in Bristol, which was the third most bombed city in England. Wow. He was riding his bike home one day when he heard a sound of pop, 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 and he didn't know what it was. He wondered, anyway, it turned out that a, a German plane had come down really low and had machine gunned people at a bus stop really on the next street to him. You know, and that's, that's, that's what people lived with. Every, and yet, you know, his mother let him out on his bicycle, not not worrying that much. It's it's amazing how brave they were. Right, and what kind of trauma they suffered that no one ever called PTSD or oh, had no. time to you know even time yeah. to do. That. Yeah, my yeah. my John said, oh, my mother was always so calm and she was never worried. I said she never let you see she was worried. I mean, you've got three little kids, and you're in a city, and your husband. I mean, John's father was the deputy director of British Airways or BOAC as it was then. And um, he, one of his jobs was inspecting all the installations on the West Coast. And apparently he went to their factory in Bath once and he spoke to the night watchman. And um, five minutes after he'd left, the, the, the factory was bombed and the night watchman was killed. So, you know, that's, that's what people lived with. So it's, I think, you know, life for us has become in many ways so, predictable. I mean, I know we have mass shootings to live with and, and, and we have the, the threat of terrorism, but on an everyday basis, we don't have to get up and think, oh God, what's going to happen today? Um, and I think it's interesting. That's probably why there's this huge interest in historicals is that during the last year of the pandemic, we have had to do that. We have to get up and say, am I going to be safe today, which hasn't happened to us ever before. So I think there's a great link to people in World War II saying, am I going to be bombed today? And us saying, are we going to catch COVID today? That's right. That's a really good point. Who knew? I mean, who knows? Um, yeah. Yeah, you know. um, and I wonder, are, do we have any questions here? I'm, I'm looking at the chat. If you have questions, please. Please let us know. We're happy to, to answer them or make a stab at it. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but let's get back to Venice. I mean, Venice wasn't bombed during World War II, right? I mean, people wouldn't, yeah. They made, both sides made a pact that they would not touch Venice. Um, so, um, which was very lucky because obviously it's such a frail city that you could have obliterated it with two bombs. But um, right. so Venice to start with had rather a charmed life because there it was on its little island. The, most of their, the, you know, there were fishermen, so the catch of fish came in normally, and the uh, the countryside and the Veneto just outside um, is very productive. So 
Um, there were plenty of vegetables, there were plenty of fish, so people weren't starving as they were in other places. And the, one of the things that got me started on this book, um, that was the real impetus to get writing on this book, because I've toyed with ideas about, I'd like to write about Venice. And anyway, I went to the Biennale, which is the big open air um, art festival they have every two years, where every country has a pavilion among the gardens. And um, I had, I got something on the history of the Biennale and I saw that it was held in 1940 and in 1942. And I thought they're holding an international art ex exhibition in the middle of a war. Who came? I mean, by 1942, the whole world was involved in the war. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Hitler has changed sides. So he's now an enemy with Stalin. So you wouldn't even have the Russians. So was this international exhibition just Germany and Italy, essentially, because everybody else was their enemy. But the fact that the Venetians are so, um, art is so important to them, that they continued their tradition until they didn't have it in 1944. Why? Because the Germans had invaded and taken over the city. Um, but um, so this art exhibition becomes like a, 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 a sort of, force behind the story that I'm writing, that it's at the exhibition each time that things happen and the story moves forward. The other thing with Venice in the war was the Venetians are remarkably tolerant and their Jews lived pretty much as they normally had done. You know, the original ghetto, the ghetto means, the word means iron foundry, and it was the iron making area of Venice where the Germans, were, where the Jews were supposed to live and pretty much they lived untouched uh, unlike the rest of Italy, they weren't required to wear the gold star. They weren't required to um, register and not go to school or anything. So they lived fairly normally until the Italians invaded in 1943. And then when the Italians took over the city, then they were rounded up and they were shipped off to camps with everybody else. I mean, the Germans, yeah. Yeah. Germans. yeah. yeah. Yeah, because um, I went to that island. I, I can't remember the name of it, where the Jewish ghetto was. It was a really lovely. I found it. Yeah, yeah. That's where. Yeah, we found a great place, and and I really like that. And good food. There's good good food, and it's not very touristy. So the thing I like. We had pomegranate juice. I mean, he squeezed the pomegranate himself. Yeah. I was with like four French children under 15 years old. Yeah. And it was like, we had to have one for everyone, right? <laughs> Which was so good. And I found little baby artichokes in the market and we cooked them that night. Uh -huh. um, I loved the market, just, I don't mean, not exactly a market, but you know, along the street. You know. That's right next to, it's Rialto. You go over the Rialto bridge and there's all the market there. And then you go just a little bit to one side and there's the fish market there. So that's where the Venetians do their shopping, either there or if you're further away, you have a barge that ties up with fresh vegetables in it. And you walk up to the barge and choose your vegetables for the day. So, yeah. And I remember I saw that at, in the afternoon or late evening, they would be taking like little garbage um, boats would come and take the garbage off. Yeah. And like red off. yeah. I was like, yeah, of course, everything has to come and go by a boat here. Yeah, John was fascinated last time. He took, uh, took lots of video. The, the garbage barge comes down the middle of the canal and then it's got a little, um, an arm on it that comes out, picks up someone's garbage, picks it up, drops it in, and then goes on to the next place. It's all very efficiently done, but everything has to be brought in and out. That's why if you live on the top floor, you're not going to walk down to get your morning newspaper. You're going to pay someone to come by with their boat and drop it into your basket. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. It's like totally brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it, I mean, it's a very special place. Yeah, I'm talking of Canareggio, which is that area where the, where the Jewish ghetto was. Um, and you get lots of little cafes that are very unpretentious and very untouristic. Yes. One of the things they do there is the spaghetti con seppi, which is the, um, the uh, ink of the cuttlefish. Mm. And it tastes lovely. It tastes very salty. It tastes like eating the ocean. But afterwards, your mouth and your tongue are completely black. And, um, <laughs> you know, and I, I had it once and John looked at me and went, ah, what's wrong with your mouth? <laughs> yes, <laughs> it stains. We it like the chichettis. The, they're like, it, like Venetian tapas. You know, oh, just yeah. go into one of those. It's like a cafe bar and yeah. it's all on the counter or 
Yeah. And these little plates, like with yes. cuttlefish or yeah. squid, or oh, yeah. I went crazy for that chichetti, you know, which I would just make a meal of it. The um, tramezzini, which are the little tiny open sandwiches, too. If you, if you, you know, for lunch, you go in and there's, you just point to one of those, one of those, and one of those. They're very cheap. They're like a dot, one euro each, you know. Yeah, yeah. Is which ones you like. And then, of course, tourists don't realize if you decide, if you're sitting down there, the price leaps up because you're not supposed to sit down. You're supposed to stand up and eat them. So, you know, you sit down, you pay more for anything in Venice, like a coffee or anything like that. Right. Same in France. Yeah. It's yeah. cheaper than, you know, in the cafe, you stand at the counter. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's so expensive out on the terrace. Of course, you're paying for the view, you're paying for time to sit down and watch everyone and have, you know, yeah. you can stay there as long as you like. Yeah, when my parents used to go to Venice when we were children, they would have coffee in St. Mark's Square every morning and listen to the orchestra. Now it's, yeah. like, it's like $30 a cup to sit there because you're paying for St. Mark's Square and you're paying for the music. So. The what is the name of that famous old cafe? It's like ancient. Oh, it's called Florian. Yes. Florian. Yes. yes. Yeah. It's still, yeah. It's still completely unchanged. Those rooms, there's the Chinese room, and that's, you know, they're, they're, it hasn't changed since 1920s. So that's a lovely place to go too. You'll pay for, pay for that too, though. Well, we um, took the four kids in there, and then we were like, ah, no, we're. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not. That was poor kids. And also <laughs> at St. Mark's Square, there's a, a museum called the Correa Museum. And mm -hmm. I did a lot of my research. It has, um, uh, it has um, a library. And I did a lot of my research at the Correa Library. And I told them what I was doing and what I was researching. So they took me and they sat me in a room with a big table. And two librarians kept bringing me books. And they kept bringing more and more books and piling them up around me. And of course, they're all in Italian, which I read, but slowly. And um, they're all about this thick. And um, in the end, when I can't see over the wall around me, I have to say, you know, you are so kind. And I think I have enough for today. And um, what I did in the end, because I realized like no way I could read them all. I found the sections I wanted in each of the books. And then I passed them across to John, who photographed them. So then later I could read everything at my leisure and just digest it all. But I told them I needed books on Venice in the 1930s, on the treatment of Jews in Venice and on the early days of the war. And then after the, you know, I needed just to make sure all of my timeline was correct and everything. So uh, they, were, they were too helpful. They were, they were really nice. But, you know, that's the sort of research that one has to do. If you, you have to get, if you're writing about a real place everything has to be right. You know, one of the things I did on research was if I knew that my heroine was going to walk from A to B, I walked from A to B. What do I, I see? Did. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you do in Paris, isn't it? Absolutely. You, that's you, what I do. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, and everyone, yeah, I just want to show my little map here because I'm very proud. They actually paid an artist to do this, a map maker, which I, yeah. very nice of them to do. But yeah, I walk everything, you know, and yeah. why wouldn't I walk everything? Where is it? Oh, it's not in this one, but yeah, I don't have. So, but I did. I mean, every place Amy goes, not Amy, Kate goes, I've yeah. ridden it, I've busted, I've metroed it, I've driven yeah. every way, but, and walked it, but I have not driven a, a horse and buggy, which she does from Pigal. I did not, I've ridden a horse, but yeah. so I've gone everywhere and you want to go everywhere because there's that detail that you notice, even yeah. if it's even if you're there in the present day, it wasn't that different in 1939 or 1940. Or those trees might have been there, or you know that building, or this you know sewer cover was there, you know, or this part of the canal, yeah. you know. Especially in Venice, how much has changed? You know, no. probably not much. I, one of the books I bought this time was a book of photographs taken in 1900, there was someone, obviously when, uh, when cameras were first available, readily available, and you could take outdoor shots, he's taken pretty much every angle of Venice in 1900. And then a modern photographer has been to exactly the same spot and taken the same shot. And I have to tell you, there's only three or four that are in any way different. <laughs> I mean, sometimes they look a little more spruced up, um, sometimes they've built on a little veranda or something, but pretty much identical. There's very little that's changed since 1900, which is, which is very, very, um, you know, reassuring. That, very and that is, 
you can always tell when someone's writing about a place where they haven't been, because you and I know if you're walking through the streets of somewhere, you come around a corner and you smell coffee roasting and you think, oh, I didn't realize, oh, that's a place where they roast the coffee. That's the place where they bake the bread. You know, all of these things you can only do if you're there and you suddenly, you know, for example, in Venice, I'm walking through a square and there's still a pump where some woman is coming and she's pumping water. Even in these days, I don't know, she's probably got water her garden or something and not drink that water anymore. But that's, <laughs> the, same, that's the same pump that Juliet saw in 1928. You know, that's what's so lovely about it. Definitely. We, Renee is asking um, a question. Can we talk about our writing process? Okay. Processes. You first, Reese. Go ahead. Your writing process. Well, yeah. um, when I know where I want to set something and I, what time I want to set, then I do all my f original background reading. And I do that a long time ahead. You know, I will have any book I can lay my hands on, I will read and I start to make all my background notes on the course of the war and everything like that. And then when I start to write, um, I write every day. I make, I make myself, I have, um, I have a commitment every day that I will not get up until I've done five pages, about 1500 words. So every morning I, I go to my office right after breakfast and I start to write. And some days those five pages are really easy and I move on and I might do seven or eight pages. Other days it's like pulling teeth. I get up, I walk around, I throw something in the washing machine, I get some coffee, I come back. But if you know you can't stop for the day till you've done those pages, and I will think at the end, oh, this is really rubbish. What have I done here? This is, you know, the next day, the first thing I do is to read them through and polish and edit. And most days, the ones I thought were rubbish, most days I thought were rubbish, I would say, um, oh, that wasn't, sorry, I hope my husband will finally get that. Call from wireless caller. Yeah, yeah, good, he's picked it up. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, the, 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 uh, the secretarial help is really fall, falling down these days. I'm sorry, I have to yeah, find I tell you, I tell yeah. you. Uh, but, and so I go all the way through till I've done a first draft. I don't ever skip ahead to something I'd love to do. And I don't ever sort of skip over something that I think will be a, be a bit tedious because if it's tedious for me, it's tedious for you. So I go all the way through and then I give it to my first, my beta readers and they come back with suggestions. Um, John, John is one of them and he's Mr. Picky. He goes through and says, you've used that word three times in this paragraph and things like that. The other ones are much more with story like, um, well, it wasn't very clear what and why was she so mean here you know all those sort of things that you know i listen to and and i adjust because of that and then i go through and do a complete rewrite and polish and then it goes off to the editor and that has to take place within six months because i have another book to write in the in the other six months so it's always this, that that deadline looming over me i don't know about you but i found last year it was really hard to be creative because hanging over us all the time was the fact that this is a time of great danger. If I make one mistake, I'm going to maybe kill my husband. You know, that's hanging over us all the time. And I found it really hard to free myself and say, oh, I feel wonderfully creative today. I didn't, but it had to be done because that lovely word deadline was there. So it's a Contact. great- Contract, yeah. <laughs> Contract, <laughs> yeah. What about you, Karen? Yeah, I mean, I have, yeah, contract is very, you know, pushes me forward, but I, I get up in the morning and I write. What I've started, what I began doing, I don't know, a few years ago, I, you know, when I first started writing, I had a small baby. And so I would get up at five and I would write for two hours because I, before everyone got up, you know, and the dog and had to go, you know, I had to be taken care of or go to work or, you know, then when they have to go to school. So I was always having that really nice, hour and a half, two hours, just pure quiet. I got so much done. And when, you know, years later when I was writing, it was like, I would spend all day trying to write my, you know, deadline, my, my uh, number of pages. And I thought when I, you know, had two hours in the morning, I got so much done. Yeah. Um, but what I, so it's changed over the years. So I write always in the morning and I write a scene for me. It's about writing a scene. Sometimes the scene is three pages. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's a page and a half, mm -hmm. but it's kind of propelling me forward to, you know, I'll read what I wrote the day before 
and I'll go back like you do and I'll kind of edit and clean it up. It propels me and then I write a scene. Sometimes I write the next scene as well. But I find that gets me from one point to the next point in the story. And then I, I write a hundred pages. I, I make a timeline. I see if the, if the story has, um, you know, if there's enough meat on it to tell the whole story. And then I keep going. And then I have people also read it at the end and look at it. Um, it's really important to have another pair of eyes, you know, mm -hmm. especially for those small details or things that, you know, I'm like, wow, she was wearing leather pants here. And now she, you know, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Dress. where did that come from? You know, um, here's another question. <laughs> yeah. When do you know you've done enough research to start writing? Do you give yourself a deadline for completing the research part of writing a book? Is it that uh, is it that clear with you, Reese? No, it's not. I I I I'm always, as I say, I like to do the big research, like the history of World War II in Venice, that you know, the, the giant stuff ahead of time. But then, as you go along, almost every page was something like, "Oh, I need to look up." Of course, I had a big map of Venice beside me. Okay, how would I get across the Grand Canal here? I don't want to go up to the Academia Bridge. Where's the Traghetto, which are those little gondolas that take me across? So you're looking up things all the time. But I find if I'm in a place that's really tense, I will just X through. You know, I rushed, I rushed across the bridge and I saw XXX, you know. And then I will look up at look at my photographs, look at and see what did she see. And I find and also a lot of this book was to do with the religious festivals. So I had to keep double checking on which day am I up to? Oh, I'm coming into November. That means there will be St. Martin's day and the kids will want to buy their St. Martin horse. You know, you can get, they make a, um, they make a, a cookie in the shape of St. Martin on his horse and the kids go around um, banging pots and asking for pennies to buy St. Martin on his horse. So, you know, things like that. So you ha have to be aware all the time of where are we coming to in the religious year because that's so important in Venice. But um, uh, yeah, and then little tiny things, you know, I know when I started writing Molly Murphy in New York in 1901, I'd done the big research. I'd got my maps of Manhattan and then she's following someone and I thought, wait, how would she, what would she take her notes on? You know, she can't carry around a pen and an inkwell. Um, you know, were fountain pens available? So I looked up and yes, fountain pens were available, but they were really expensive. She couldn't afford one. So what would she take her notes on? So, you know, things like that challenge you all the time you're writing. Right, right. I remember writing um, uh, the book Murder, is it Murder in Saint-Germain, where there's this old ancient festival um, in, in the Place de la Nation and at Place de la Trone. And it was, it was started when one of the king's sons was, was killed by a wild pig because people could have wild, you know, pigs and things on yes. the streets in Paris in the medieval times. But um, when the wild pig gored the, the son of the king, he banished all the pigs, except for the priests who had their own little like refectories or the convents. And, and finally, He's, they made these cookies, like reminded me, they're like gingerbread of pigs. Oh, that yeah. Would, yeah. yeah. Every year would be, and was like, why are, why would she be eating a pig cookie? You know, which, and I didn't know, about, but you have to know those things, yeah. you know, yeah. you know, how it comes back in time. Um, but yeah, and I also, I pick up odd bits of research. I write, you know, for three hours in Paris, I was just, I had lots of notebooks, you know, about all the time when I go to Paris and things that fit, but they didn't fit in the AMA books, but they were nuggets about World War II. Yeah. And then when I found that, that uh, historical footnote about Hitler's visiting Paris one time, one time only for three hours, yeah. I was like, yeah. why? I mean, that made no sense. There's something going on. And when the two men in his party, and we, we can see pictures of them, they both uh, talked about it after the war, after their prison sentences about, and they said they were there at two different times, June 23rd or June 28th. And they're both in the picture. And I was like, something happened. Yeah. And yeah. what if? So yeah. then I went back and trying to do all that research. It's sort of as, as you do, I'll put an X and I'll go back and I'll find out that specific detail or yeah. this is what happened, you know, and finding a printed source. So it kind of goes both ways with me as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, that was an absolute gift to you, wasn't it? Find, finding, I mean, talk that, that nugget that, and, and you were smart enough to say, wait, this doesn't make sense. And uh, it does, I still do, I still think something, <laughs> thank yeah. you, but yeah. I still think there is something behind that, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was never really challenged, you know? Yeah. And you helped me when, uh, in that story, when I had Kate taking the train from London up to Scotland, I had her, because I had gone and you said, no, it's not that station, you know? And yeah. I was like, thank you. I mean, I would never have known yeah. that, you know, the stations yeah. were different, right? Well, no, it's just in those days, there was no way around London. So if you were going south, you went from a south station. If you were going north, you went from one of the north. You still do. If you were going to Scotland, you'd still go from King's Cross or, or Euston because they're the lines that go directly north. Right, right. They were, they were all, in the, it's like Paris. They were all owned by different companies in the old days. And so London, Midland and Scottish railways went out of King's Cross. Okay, yeah. Well, I can tell you about Paris, but thank you. <laughs> and there's Alison, hi. Yeah. Hi. 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 So it looks like we're wrapping up. I see one more question. I don't know if you guys want to tackle it. Um, sure, yeah. Yes. North of the equator, when do you know you've done enough research to start writing? Do you give yourself a deadline for completing the research part of writing a book? <laughs> uh, I don't. I, 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 I know I start writing. I'm not one of those people who outlines. So I start writing knowing fairly little. I know I'm going to be writing about a person in Venice and World War II is going to start um, and things are going to happen. But then you know, things do happen and they're not always what I expected. And I like to be surprised. I think if I'm surprised, then my reader's surprised. So I don't want to be a puppet master and make my characters do things. You know, I want, I want to let them have free reign. And so, and I, and I do the little research as we've been saying, as we go along, I'm always checking up on the little things like, you know, where, where would she stop for a cafe? And, you know, what would this be? And um, so things like that. Yeah. Definitely, definitely, always, yeah. I mean, I can, I mean, when I was last in Paris, I found, a, it was a newly opened um, resistance museum. And I went in there and there was a newspaper from June 24th, 1940. And I was like, where have you been in this three years that I've been writing the story? <laughs> yeah. Well, it was the first newspaper published and it was one sheet, you know, published right after and talked about when they, you know, when Hitler had come there and it was like, well, here's the proof that Hitler came on the 23rd. Yeah. Whatever happened. And I was like, thank you. So even though that didn't appear, I mean, in the story, I have it. And it also, I think, gives gives yeah. weight to our, our book, you know, that we've yeah. done the work. I mean, it, we don't want it to show on the page, but it gives a weight to the story. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. It's you. lovely spending the, the hour with you. And, you know, thank you for imparting all your wisdom and experiences. And we can't wait to meet again in person. And meanwhile, I'm sure before then, you guys will both have another book out. And we can't wait to see your collaboration race with your daughter. So yeah, that'll thank you. Yes, I'm excited too. And Kara, yeah. thanks so much for taking the time to chat again. Thank My you. My pleasure. See you. And you know, you can buy their books at Book Passage. You can either purchase them online through our website. You can call the store. You can come in and buy it because we're open nine to five or 10 to five every day. Um, we look forward to seeing you. And um, thank you so much again. Um, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye.